Greetings, everybody, and a warm welcome to the sixth and final webinar of the second season of the Governing Intimacies webinar series. The first season ran from July to November last year and was themed Governing Intimacies in Lockdown. And the team behind Governing Intimacies, that is uh, Srila Roy, Kayo Arojo, and Nehama Brody, have been kind enough to make recordings of all nine episodes from the first season available on the Governing Intimacies YouTube channel. And I believe the first five um, webinars from this second season should also be available um, on, on YouTube. So I would strongly encourage you if you've not been following um, the series to please check out the previous uh, material on, on the YouTube channel, which is in itself an, a, a very beautiful archive of the kinds of conversations around feminist thought um, and questions of intimacy that um, this series has been engaging with. So the second season of this series is themed Intimate Archives, and I'm delighted to chair today's session, which is titled Writing with Feminist Archives. And the two questions we're grappling with today are firstly, how can we creatively engage with the African feminist archive or archives in that um, to, in, in the plural sense of the term? And related to that, then how does it speak to the current affects, practices, and political imaginations? What kinds of what are the ways of working with these archives across different temporal frames as well? So it's my pleasure to chair this session featuring three feminist writers and thinkers and friends whose work is central to my own nourishment as a woman, as an African feminist, and as a teacher. Firstly, we've got Makosazana Kaba, who's an, an anthologist, essayist, short story writer, and poet with award-winning and space-making poetry and short story anthologies to her name. And I've taken the liberty of really abbreviating our panelists' um, Bio biographies because otherwise we will need the entire hour to just introduce them so you'll have to bear with me on that and uh, Makoso Zana's books include These Hands and Tongues of Their Mothers uh, which are poetry volumes as well as the collection Running and Other Stories and also two edited anthologies Queer Africa One and Two and she's currently based at Wiser at Vets, where she's working on an exciting project that is a biography of Helen Nontando Jabavu, popularly known as Noni Jabavu. She's also recently co-edited the volume Foundational African Writers, which looks at four writers whose, who, uh, whose um, centenaries we marked recently. And these are Peter Abrahams, Noni Jabavu, Sibusi Sonyemezi, and Eskiam Patlele. And she's co-edited this with Kwezim Kize and Peggy Siswe Peterson. And this book is forthcoming from Vitz Press soon. Our second speaker is Barbara Bozel, who's a feminist literary scholar and creative writer with research and teaching interests in Black diasporic women's writing, Black South African women's literature and queer theory. And she's an associate professor and current head of department at the English Literary Studies Department of, at the University of Cape Town. And Barbara is also the author of and wrote my story anyway, Black South African women's novels as feminism, which came out with Bits Press last year. And it's a really exciting collection. I'd encourage you to look it up, as well as her novel, um, Grace and Novel, which was a winner of the Johannesburg University of Johannesburg Debut Creative Writing Prize. And she's currently working on a literary biography of Loretta Ngobo. Our third speaker is Pumla Dineo Tola, who is a Sachi Chair in African Feminist Imagination at the Nelson Mandela University. And her books include What is Slavery to Me? Postcolonial Slave Memory in Post-Apartheid South Africa, A Renegade Called Simpiwe, Reflecting Rogue, and most recently Miriam Clary, Writing Freedom, among other titles. Her book, Rape, a South African Nightmare, is a winner of the 2016 Sunday Times Alan Payton Award. And her latest book is titled The Female Fear Factory, which should be hitting the bookstores at the end of June, if I'm not wrong. And all three authors have also contributed to this exciting anthology titled, I hope you can see it on my screen. Yeah. And it's titled Surfacing. Um, on being Black and feminist in South Africa. And I would strongly encourage you to not only get the collection, which is edited by another pair of um, feminist friends and colleagues to all of us, Desiree Lewis and Habiba Badirun, and you definitely want to read um, their, their chapters in that 
book as well as other colleagues' chapters. So the format of today's um, session is that each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes in the order in which I've introduced them. And then um, I'll open us up for discussion with maybe a question or two, and then we can open up to the audience. So I'll hand over to you, Kosi. Except it appears I've lost Kosi on my screen. So um, shall I, uh, shall I, shall we um, probably start with you, Barbara, if you don't mind? Right. I think Thank we you. might be having connectivity <laughs> problems. <laughs> Oh, this is dread, uh, you know, the dread that comes when you're the first speaker. Um, and I was so happy that it was Corsi, and now it's me. Um, thank you so much, Grace, for introducing us and for holding the space as you do so beautifully. And thank you to Sri Leroy and the team, um, the Governing Intimacies team, for inviting us and for inviting me um, to speak about this really important question and exciting question. And I think what a great um, way to end your series and I'm so honored to be in the company of Makosa Zana and Pumla um, and also you Grace it's always such a pleasure to speak with you and to think with you. Um, my thoughts are very um, scattered in a way and I'm going to really be posing rather a set of questions or provocations than providing anything concrete, because I'm thinking through a lot of questions about the archive and of what, what it means to be a feminist, what it means to be an African feminist, engaging and working with the archive in my own research. So I'll start with really my point of departure. I've, I've drawn very much in writing my own scholarship in doing my book and wrote my story anyway, which looks at Black women's literary production and novels as feminist theory. Um, I was guided very much by the work of Yvette Christiansen, who is one of the writers that I write about in the, in the book. Um, and Yvette Christiansen, of course, is the author of an amazing, wonderful, deeply complex novel called Unconfessed, which is about slave histories in the Cape and based on the true story of an enslaved woman, Silla van den Kapp, who... Christiansa writes about in her academic work, in her scholarship, um, she found traces of this person's story in the archive at the Cape, in Rulan Street in Cape Town, where I'm sitting at, on this rainy day. And, um, you know, the only word that she found, it was a fragment, and she talks about the fragments in the archive that we, as scholars who are coming from the margins, whether we are Black um, women, queer, our histories have not been documented. Um, we do not exist in official historical records and how we can go into those archives, read them against the grain and collect fragments through which we can construct um, alternate histories. And this is not a new idea. Um, it, 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 you know, there are lots of scholarship around this issue of the fragmented um, archive and how we as um, oppositional knowledge producers, if you will, can utilize those tools. Um, I also think about the idea of the scattered archive, which I came across in Pumla Dineo Gola's recent book on Mariam Tladi. And she writes a beautiful, um, summation of this idea of Tladi's work as being a scattered archive. Tladi, of course, um, is also a, a writer that I work on, and we know that some of her work, we, we, I visited her house, Pumla visited her house, she had a study with lots of documents, and um, they were in a bit of disorder. Um, we know she buried some of her manuscripts. We know some of her manuscripts were stolen by academics from Europe who came and were interested and seduced her in a way saying, we want to write about you, and then took her work and never returned it. And she was angry and heartbroken about those works. And we know that police also seized her work. Um, she told me a story about arriving from the workshop in Iowa, 
and having written there and having to smuggle off her writing to an American citizen on the plane when they landed in Johannesburg because she knew that the special branch was waiting for her to confiscate all her writing. And, and what that means for producing an archive um, when you are so harassed um, and so persecuted that whatever articulation you make um, is liable and likely to be seized and destroyed because it's so dangerous. So these ideas, the, the fragmented and the scattered archive. Um, and then um, I, I've, been, I've been sitting with these ideas and very much seeing myself as a scholar in this tradition of working with the scattered and the fragmented archive. And the questions that animate me are, is, is really, or the question rather, is how do we alchemize and what do we al alchemize from these scattered archives? Um, I think of myself as a decolonial African scholar. Um, whether I succeed in that, I don't always know if I do in producing work, which is in, in, along that trajectory, but this is what I'm aiming for. And the fragments of the archive and the scatteredness of the archive, I see it as one of my tasks as a knowledge producer to, to bring some coherence um, and to alchemize something out of this that will um, intervene into dominant discourses and produce new knowledge um, from a subaltern standpoint. So, so there I was feeling happy and a little, maybe a little bit smug with myself as yes, I have this figured out. And then we have the 18th of April when the library at the University of Cape Town where I work um, burns down. And forgive me, I may get emotional. Um, I was attached to the space. Um, I loved it. Um, I see myself as like many other people having a very complicated history with the University of Cape Town. And this was one of the spaces where I actually felt fully part of it. One of the few spaces in the university. I worked there a lot. I used the um, collections. I found the librarians to be extremely helpful. And then I had a conversation with a younger feminist um, and I'm saying younger, not to foreground age, but because I think these intergenerational conversations are very important. And her name is Wanalisa Klaba. And I'm going to read the opening paragraph of something that she wrote when the archive burnt down. Um, and she writes about the body as a moving ancestral archive and writes about this in Culture Review as prompted by the fire at the University of Cape Town. Or rather, I'm quoting Klaba now, Wanalisa Klaba, by my disappointment at Black people's response to the fire that destroyed indigenous archives at the African Studies Library. As I waded through the collective Black middle-class despair on my social media timeline, I was overwhelmed with anger, primarily anger that those archives were imprisoned in one of the most violent and spiritually dark institutions that continues to manufacture Black misery. Um, this is the, these are the opening words of an essay that Wanelisa Klaba wrote. And subsequently, we've had um, a conversation in person, the two of us, and she expressed again, I'm, I was one of those feminists that she was disappointed in about why were you crying about the loss of this archive, which was produced in this um, violent way, which is there because of these violent seizures. And um, she thinks about it as almost imprisoned knowledge that people don't have access to. Um, so people in Langa, people in Alsis River, for example, um, who, the, the, the average person living there, um, trying to make life there, what do they know about these knowledge circuits and these spaces? And do these spaces exist for them? Even though we know that that particular collection was open to the public, anyone could come in and work there and work with it. Um, so we were having conversations about this. And at first, you know, there was a lot of resistance. And then I thought about myself as an older feminist, again, not to foreground age, but there seems to be 
a need for an intergenerational conversation um, between older, for want of a better word, black feminists um, or African feminists and, and a, a new generation. Um, and I know that Kaba is part, was, was forged um, her feminism, and I don't want to talk on her behalf, within the student movement of the 2015s, um, starting in 2015 onward. And a lot of, I think, um, important feminist voices have come from that movement. And I think that we, uh, as more established in the university um, or in spaces of publishing need to listen. We need to have a moment of actually really taking seriously what these feminists are saying about these archives. And so I suppose my provocation really is, um, and it's a question that I'm not, that I haven't answered for myself, is how do we, um, if we're in a process of rebuilding an archive at the moment at UCT, and if there are ways in which we can have these conversations between generations, between people outside of the university, between knowledge producers who do not have access to that space, um, historians, writers, people who are telling stories, who are making stories, who are making life outside of the university. And how can we, at this particular moment, when we are reimagining the archive, and yes, so much has been lost, and we're grateful for what has been saved, but how do we actually think through issues of accessibility, of what it means to have certain types of um, documents, artifacts within a space? And um, how do we democratize knowledge in rebuilding that archive? Um, I will stop there. I'm not sure if I've used my full 10 minutes, but I think that's enough um, for now from me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I think that's an excellent um, way to launch us into this conversation. And in, in a little time, you've really taken us through a whole range of questions and concerns around working with archives, around um, fleshing out the traces that we find in archives and what that enables, but also around the implications of loss and lost archives, but also losses that precede the loss of certain kinds of archives that in a way um what 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 one elisa Klaba was telling you um if i'm hearing her correct them correctly is that those archives at uct were lost to some people even before they got lost to the fire and so what what do we do with that how do we sit with um just difficult questions that sometimes we don't have answers to but that nonetheless we need to make space for and at the very least try and and chew on them so thank you so much for that um i think kosi is still struggling so pumla um the last shall be second <laughs> over to you um thank you very much um grace uh, good afternoon colleagues um Thank you, Grace, for that incredible contribution um, and framing of, of, of what we um, are here to talk about today. It's actually um, always so wonderful to listen to, to, um, to, to both you and, 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 and Barbara. And I think that um, certainly so much, because so much of my thinking around archives is in conversation with, 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 your, with, your, with your own work, I'm hoping that the what I have to offer today is not going to be too boring, especially to 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 um to to the to the to the two of you in ways in ways that that, that should be clear. Um, thank you very much to uh, Srila and Kayo and Eurisha for convening this space um, as part of this incredible series. Um, I haven't been able to watch all all of them, but I've certainly been watching many of the of, of the seminars in the in 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 the in the in the in the series. Um, on the YouTube channel. Thank you for convening this space. Thank you, Barbara, for, for that, for that, um, for the ideas that you and the and the challenge that you pose in the in, in, in the presentation that, that that precedes um mine. Like um Barbara, I am 
going to offer a series of perhaps less provocations and more struggles. Um, and I'm going to do so for the purposes of today, because I only have 10 minutes, thankfully. Um, to I'm going to do this through, through, through some of the questions, through some of the battles I'm having in, in, in thinking about um, Miriam Tladi and the, and, the, and the archive. And I'm thinking about Miriam Tladi and the archive, um, Miriam Tladi's archive, Miriam Tladi and the archive, Miriam Tladi and the apartheid archive, Miriam Tladi also as the archive that is a South African literary um, canon. So let me just get to it then. So I'm not presenting a paper, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just presenting a few um, areas of, of, of difficulty that I am um, confronting currently in relation to this work. So until recently, Miriam Blady's position in the South African, in South African within literary studies, she certainly cannot be said to have suffered in the novel which catapulted her to that I'm sorry, Pumla, we seem to it's be having connectivity issues. In English, inside South Africa, exile. Sorry, in Pumla? In South Africa. Um, uh, Pumla, I'm sorry, we, 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 we didn't catch the first bit of what you said like a minute ago. So, um, but what we're going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Kaya and myself to go off video in the hope that that will help your connection. Sorry. Okay, so I'm not sure if, um, so can you signal if that is... Um, Is this better? Okay, should I start again? I'm not sure at which point. Um, so we lost the, you about the, a the, minute the, the ago. Connectivity issues um, came. Mm, about about a okay. minute ago. So. Um, okay, so. I'm, I'm speaking about um, Thadi's position and positioning in, 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 in the South African, in the archive of South African letters. And by South African letters, I'm referring to both um, the way in which we think about the space South African literature, um, the way in which we critically engage with what is the canon of South African literature or the borders of, of the boundaries of that, of that, of that canon. And um, I think that it's important to note that um, Tladi's um, position is not characterized necessarily by something we might call neglect, that there are different patterns in engaging with and in thinking through and in writing about and teaching Tladi's work that we see in, in, the, in, the, in the South African, in the South African, in the South African Academy in different ways for, 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 for scholars differently located, both in terms of kind of generation, loosely defined, um, in the in the in the academy, so not calendar, not, not biographical um, generation, but generation in terms of entry and positioning in 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 the in the in the in the academy, um, as well as of course uh, the kinds of um, organizing ideas that inform scholars of of, of study. So, for example, in the in, in in the scholarship of early predominantly the white literary scholars like Dry, Dorothy Driver, Margaret Damon, Margaret Lanter, Cheryl Lockett, Cicely Lockett, and others, um, we see a reading of Tladi as a Black woman writer engaged in the project of imaginally working out the meanings produced by the intersections of history, race, and gender in, in, in academic publications and interviews. So this location then of Tladi as someone who is important to the archive of thinking of thinking gender, the connections between gender, race, history, and writing, and, 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 and the imagination. In um, those of her contemporaries, sometimes contemporaries who are also literary scholars, um, like Jabul Ndebele and William Zamani, engage with Tladi in literary, engage her literature in ways that complicate both her representational repertoires, so how she writes about things in her fiction, but also where to locate her in 
the archive of South African um, literature and South African black writing and, and, and so on. And of course we see that uh, with the arrival of a second novel, Amandla, um, we, we, there's a shift again in, in the relationship between kind of Zadi's writing and, 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 and which archive she belongs to and how to locate her in, in, in the archive in the work of predominantly Marxist literary scholars, right? Who position her quite clearly as occupying um, as, as, as the writer, as a writer of one of the most important um, body of novels that imaginatively, imaginatively revisit the 1976 uprising. This deliberate positioning of Tladi's prose fiction as both an integral part of how literary scholars think about Black women's writing, writing gender and feminism, protest literature, resistance literature, Soweto literature, Black South African literature matters in more than one way in constructing her place in literary critical terms. Her short stories have received some attention, but significantly less attention as a whole, um, and significantly less consistent attention than her two novels. Uh, now, Barbara Boswell's work on Tladi, of course, further complicates this received knowledge um, and this tradition of, of writing about Tladi that we that we that, that we are all inheritors um, of. So the constitution of this archive. Um, and, 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 and of, of the Tladi archive, but also the, the, the location, the relocated, the constant shifting locations of Tladi within the larger um, archive of South African or South African letters. Boswell's work in different, in different ways challenges us to think about the meanings attributed to her work, as well as the work that Tladi's writing does, what it creates, how it creates an, a certain archive, um, how exactly it theorizes. In um, Boswell's work and mine, we've also given some attention, of course, to the, to the sometimes difficult um, construction of Tladi as first, right? So complicating it in ways, in ways that, 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 that some other scholars in the South African context of archive have often spoken about um, the work that archives do. So for example, in the introduction to um, a book uh, refiguring the archive, Carolyn Hamilton and her colleagues invite us to think about the ways in which archives also construct, sanctify, and bury paths. And I think we spend considerable time looking at how archives construct and, 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 and perhaps bury paths. But I think part of what um, Boswell, Barbara's work, um, Boswell's work invites us to do is to think about and, and, and hopefully some of my more recent work on, on, on Tladi, thinks about what it might mean in the work of sanctifying, so the first. So there are many ways in which we can think about Tladi and archive, some of which I've touched, I'm touching on very quickly. So I do not then have a quarrel with the attention she has received in literary criticism. Again, the word here is not neglect. Rather, what is what I'm struggling with in my own work currently is how to tease out rather than trace the ways in which to think about Tladi and archive simultaneously in itself is in itself generative work in relation to existing work in addition to the canon and some of the effects of the bulk of the attention being devoted specifically to her prose fiction. So the question then is what does it mean and how does paying attention to Tladi's work as archive and thinking about the place in that archive of her much more plentiful nonfiction, sometimes creative nonfiction, and most recently um, her plays, only one of which we have access to, complicate this idea, these relationships, these received um, relationships, these decades old relationships, then that we have come to take for granted around who Tladi is and the relationship of Tladi to the, to the South African literary archive, to, to, to receive notion, to, to kind of, um, to, to thinking about gender and South African um, presence and pasts, but also um, it, 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 the larger canon then of, 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 of South African, excuse me, of South African, of South African letters. Um, in, in relation to this, then the question of, what to do 
with, it, it slightly figures very much as a writer of prose fiction and the bulk of um, very um, complicated and proliferating um, reception to her, pays attention to her fiction. In what ways might what we think about the relationship between um, Tladi and the Apartheid archive, um, Tladi and the feminist archive, Tladi and various intersecting archives be complicated? When we think about when we think about the scattered archive, when we think about um, Tladi's plays, as I said, um, one of the plays, um, although Tladi spoke often in interviews about having written two plays. Um, these two plays and, 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 and both plays have been performed at Yale and at different institutions in, 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 in the Netherlands. Until recently, we have not had access to, to, this, to these archives. And in fact, um, the access to, to, to these plays rather, access to one of these plays is um, enabled for me and hopefully for um, all of us through an accident of fate in many ways, um, where Ali Songwana, who I'm now grateful to um, remember, Ali Songwana um, provides me in a, in a, in, in a social moment um, where, where, where both he and I are attending um, um, the, a, theater, a theater performance with a manuscript of studies until that point lost manuscript of, of um, crimen, crimen in, 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 in injuria. And of course, as we tend then, as we read this play, which is a play that's included in, 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 the, in the HSRC um, volume that I wrote and edited, um, Miriam Tladi writing, writing Freedom. How might then this new availability of Tladi's play complicate this idea or how we think about life? How might we think about um, so in one sense, and it seems to suggest that now that we have this play, um, we're able to do, we have the opportunity and the capacity to engage and rethink what Tladi's archive is. However, when we think about um, the much more substantive in terms of quantity, amount of work that Tladi produced, published work by Tladi that um, takes on the form of creative nonfiction, sometimes called a column um, in, in, in Soweto, Soweto um, speaking, um, in her, her plentiful essays that she wrote about and against censorship and about some of them autobiographical essays on the state of writing and the harassment of writers in South Africa, some of them specifically around censorship published in South African literary magazines, as well as magazines such as, such as Index on Censorship published elsewhere. In, in, in the world. Seems to me then an opportunity to think not only about Tladi's work in terms of incompletion, but in ways that also um, connect to what Barbara uh, Boswell was saying, was arguing for as she spoke before us today, where she references archives in terms of fragments, what to do these fragments, Barbara Boswell, of course, speaking there um, through, in part, through Yvette Christiansen. And of course, I find incredibly useful um, and draw deeply in my thinking about like the and other feminist archives from Nondobe Gondombela, the art historian's notion of the scattered, um, of the scattered archive um, in, in thinking about those parts of Tladi's work that we do not have access to because we simply, um, it might still be buried in a garden, um, the stolen manuscript, and, 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 and so on. I'm also thinking through what um, Sarah Nuttall highlights when she reads through what she calls the excisions that are implemented when Tladi's manuscript, I Am Nothing, gets published as Muriel Metropolitan. Um, some of you will remember, of course, that Muriel Metropolitan is the is although it's the first novel and it's and it's Tladi's entry into literary publicness, it's a novel that also she is incredibly um, ambivalent about. And, and 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 a title that she is the content of which, the size of which, the editing of which, um, and the titling of which she's incredibly in battle. She refers to two preferred titles: I am nothing and between two and between and between two worlds. So it's not simply what gets taken out as text, but also what becomes impossible 
when the framing changes so significantly. And these are implications, and, 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 and so that it is important to continue to grapple, in, as, I, as I wrap up, um, to grapple with, 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 with not simply a scattered archive as involving those parts of Tladi's work that are unavailable, but to think also about the ways in which we make decisions about which parts of her writing are worth um, engaging with. Um, some of which, of course, reveal our own internal as a discipline, as, a, as, as disciplines, as feminists who do interdisciplinary work, our own anxieties about how to read, um, how to read um, in repertoires that are not that are not the, 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 the kind, that are not the fictional modes that perhaps we are most comfortable with. And I wonder then, as a final sentence, whether some of the, 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 the thinking um, we, 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 we are drawn to when we, when we approach and reapproach and think and reread um, these relationships to archive um, are not haunted um, necessarily by our by the, by, 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 by the pride of place. That, 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 that literary criticism in the South African Academy as elsewhere um, attaches specifically to fictional, um, to fictional, to fictional, to fictional modes. But even as, as a discipline, literary criticism has a long standing um, insistence on, on, on reading creative nonfiction, not just as biography, but in a variety of other ways. In fact, in much of our criticism, there's been an aversion to think about to think about what it might mean to read literary in literary critical and other disciplinary ways, um, bodies of work that 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 might in fact fundamentally challenge who we think Tladi is, what we think the Tladi archive is, and what positions Tladi um, can occupy in, in in feminist archives and 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 and, and other archives of thinking, sociality, and 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 and, and movement in South Africa. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Pumla. And I think your, I like how you uh, both both your, your your comments and 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 Barbara's in a way um, dovetail very nicely because you're you're both approaching the question of archives as inherently qualified in 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 different kinds of ways, whether they're fragmented, whether they are. Um, scattered whether they are alienating and excluding or lost as i said earlier from even before they're, they're they're lost in the um in a literal sense but also the second thread that seems to be um tying your thoughts together is uh just barbara's beautiful phrase of alchemizing the archive alchemizing this whatever this qualified archive that we're working with and you, you, you're coming at it in terms of the kinds of choices we are making, especially as, as scholars and, and widely as the public, what kinds of choices are we making in the manner in which we approach these archives and what are the, the ethical, and I'm using ethical in a, in a larger sense than just um, questions of morality here, but what are, the, what are the ethics that inform our relationship to the archives that we're um, we're approaching, and what are the implications of the choices that we're making? Um, so, as as, as you're both speaking, I, I I kept thinking also around the question of creative creative writing, imaginative work, not just writing, because I think you both are also interested in multiple genres beyond um, the conventionally literary, um, but creative work or imaginative work broadly as practices of archive making and archive building in themselves. And I think with, with, with the both of you both, um, but the kind of work that both of you have done on Miriam Plady, but also the kind of work that, um, for instance, Pumla, your, your, your chapter on Goliath's, uh, Goliath's um, artwork in the surfacing volume, and Barbara, your, just your entire engagement with Black women um, writers. But for me, what, what stayed with me in your book is your engagement with, with uh, for instance, somebody like Zoe Wickham and how she's able to use fiction to actually counter um, the TRC's official attempt to completely mute or excise, and again, to use that completely violent term, to but deliberately so, to excise 
sexual violence and experienced by women as part of the, the, the human rights violations that were legible to the TRC. So she's able to use fiction to address this exition within um, the, the official um, engagements with the traumas of apartheid. Uh, I've got a whole lot of questions flying all over my mind, but I see we not we don't seem to have um, Kosi back on the line, which is such a terrible shame because I, I think I would have loved to hear and would all have loved to hear her thoughts um, around these questions. Uh, perhaps for me, just two or three comments and you can decide what to what to respond to or not and then we can move on to to the q a uh, the first relates to questions of opacity and it's it's a selfish question because i'm interested in uh, in the question of opacity and related to that i'm coming at it then in relation to privacy um and i wonder whether in your work for the both of you working with archival material how do you have there been instances when you've made choices that were about preserving the privacy of the subject you're engaging with rather than um in other words i think when we think about archives we we, we, we tend to depart from a point of the need to know is it's it's an absolute need that people need to know about you know lives and experiences and periods but are there are there are there times when archives need to be suppressed or to not be circulated and and what are the implications of that and then my, my second one relates to what you said barbara about and which was really moving for me that your the loss of the of, and the damage of the UCT library was at one level, the loss of the actual material there, but at another level, it was the, 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 the loss of particular affects, I think if, if I'm hearing you correctly, particular affects, a particular relationship that you had crafted with this space and the material in this space. So um, where I'm going with this is, I'm wondering what your thoughts are around thinking around what might be called affective archives, but I want to broaden that also to think around questions of, can we talk about spiritual archives, for instance, and what are the, what are the, what are, what are the implications of that and the ways in which they resist conventional legibility? And I think uh, many of us, particularly those of us who are anchored in an Africanist um, and an African cultural or black cultural sensibility might be able to relate to what I'm trying to say, but I don't know how to frame it. But I'm curious about just um, the notion of spiritual stroke affective archives, which are very ephemeral, but they're very much part of our realities um, as black folk. And I imagine other communities have the same um, relationships as well. Thanks, may I? Yes, please. Um, because the first question you asked, Grace, thank you, um, is, is really something that I also grapple with, opac opac opacity and privacy, these issues. Um, and um, I think, you know, I was, as, as I'm talking about democratizing the archive and democratizing the knowledge that can be found there, there is this tension that you have asked, that you have brought to the surface through your question. And when I was in graduate school in the United States, I had a, a friend of mine who was in the program with me. Her name is Shauna Smith. And she was, her part-time job, she was the archivist for a layer um, Bundles, the great granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker. If you know American history, C.J. Walker is a huge figure with hair products, and her great granddaughter um, is a writer. And so she would um, um, employ my friend to come twice a week to take her personal papers and archive them. And, and my friend Shauna used to take these photos and show me, you know, these are the, the containers and I'm alphabetizing this and now I'm working on that. And um, recently I'm going to connect this to work I'm doing on Loretta Norbo's biography. I've had access to her personal archive through her family. Um, and, uh, you know, both of these women, whereas Alea, bundles is very, very um, 
quite uh, assertive in curating her archive. Loretta Noble also curated her archive. And there is the way in which um, I also had another conversation. I'm just drawing on all these threads um, with, with Shanna Tom, um, Green Thompson, a scholar in the United States, where she was talking about Black women specifically, what they put out in the public domain is very, very much curated and thoughtfully presented because um, we have to think about our reputations and how this might read to others and what things that cannot be made public because already we exist in a space where our lives are seen as less valuable, um, where we are laboring under stereotypes about what it is to be a black woman, whatever that may be, the imaginary that positions us in certain ways. So these are two writers, Alea Bundles and Loretta Noble, who were very, very conscious and self-consciously creating the, the archive. Noble was very conscious about what she was leaving. She was conscious about her mortality and, and what she wanted to leave once her body was gone. Um, and, and so the, the question then of privacy um, does come up and what do you, um, what do you, as a, as a researcher, you finding stuff, what is, what is put out in the public domain, what is your responsibility, what, what are the ethics of making visible some of these things. I think of myself, and this is a question I have for Pumla, also I am a writer, I, I have in my will instructions for certain sets of documents like these need to be destroyed, these need to be can be saved because I, you know, at some point in the future, who knows what might be of value to someone else. But there are certain things that I would absolutely hate to have in the public domain, which are very present in my life at the moment. And so, I mean, I think part of this is where feminist community is interesting because a, a few years back when we were writing those chapters for surfacing, which you reference now, I have a personal letter from Miriam Tladi where she wrote to me after I sent her my PhD dissertation. And she was giving me um, feedback and praise. And, but there were other things in the letter. And I shared this with, I actually phoned Pumla and we had a long, you know, hours long conversation on the phone. And I said, I wrote this essay for surfacing. The editors are saying my own personal self is completely absent and my relation to Tladi, I should write about that more. And I thought, here's the letter. And it, it, it presented me with an enormous ethical dilemma. And then Pumla said, you know what, Barbara Boswell, when you die one day, that letter is going to go into an archive and someone else is going to write about it. So, you know, to help me think this through, how, you know, how can you write about it in a way that um, is not exploitive, it does not perpetuate some sort of outsider's gaze on Tladi. Um, she wrote you this letter she meant for you to have this information. She knew who you were. She knew you were a scholar and you were publishing work. So therefore, you know, may, do with that, think about that, think through those issues. And, and um, so, so I think what is helpful in thinking through those issues of privacy and protection and also what Shanna Thompson calls my, her own loyalty to her craft as a researcher, her profession. So are you bound as a researcher to reveal something that, you know, the, these are questions that we, we, we really have to grapple with. Um, and I would argue there are moments where you, where you arguably you shouldn't. And this is where my community is helpful because I, I can actually sit and talk in confidence with a few people and say, what is the right thing to do here? Um, and, and, and I think that is a really helpful way. And, and I'm drawing on these resources like the Living Archive, perhaps, of Pumla's knowledge um, to think through what is my ethical, what is my responsibility here? Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Barbara. And I think what, what you're also taking us back to is our ongoing involvement in archive creation that I think sometimes we tend to think of archives as something that is, you know, 
behind us that has that's long in the past, but actually even this current conversation is part of archive building. And so it's about the extent to which we make choices around even what is possible now that might be possible differently 10 years from now, as as, as Pamela was telling you about um, in relation to the letter. But um, over to you, Pamela. So, oh my goodness, what a wonderful question. Um, and what a difficult question. I mean, I think I'm just listening to Barbara and I'm, um, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, and of course I think this, I, I thank you for that question, Grace, because I think that it is uh, this, this, this kind of I, relationship between, between opacity and privacy in, in the, in the, in the, in kind of archives and, 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 in, fem in, in feminist engagements with archives, which are not always the same things, right? I mean, feminists engage with archives in a in a variety in a variety of, of, of ways because we're so um, differently situated. But I must say that uh, one of the most one of the things that are perpetually present in my brain, not just in my mind, when I'm thinking about um, it, it, it feels like a visceral presence. Is is I I I when I try to negotiate this um, relationship between what availability and unavailability, um, I I am constantly mindful of the words of of of, of five specific um, South African feminists differently um, located, um, and I and, and and I suppose of 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 older generations. I'm constantly a mind Southern African rather. I'm constantly mindful of. Zoe Wickham's absolute irritation, which is very similar to Tsitsi Dangaremga's irritation around, around which aspects of Black creative women's lives um, should be made available for public circulation. So let me say it less cryptically. So both Wickham and Dangaremga um, we come writes about it. Dangaremga speaks about it in several, in several, in several interviews. And the irritation is around is 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 in relation to kind of processes of of, of compiling archives. So, and it's an irritation that that interestingly, um, Nondobe Godambela, who works in a different tradition, right? She's a she's an art historian, an art critic, and an an artist, and a and a and a, um, a, a curator herself. Um, that she shares this irritation. So I often wonder what it means that this thing keeps kind of um, reoccurring in, 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 in what appear to be very different intellectual projects of mine. What is the irritation? The irritation stems from their claim that they all make very differently. That part of the ways in which black women's creative and in creative work, literary and visual, um, moves into publicness in South Africa is through not only the assumption that which circulates, right? That 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 black women are always available um, for for visibility, you know, that, that they're perpetually available to be looked at, Ness and, and and so on, but also through the obsessive, what they insist is an obsessive interest in creative women's biographies. Dombela says quite frankly that um, although Mkuzandlu, which is the artist that she kind of theorized that, 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 that she, whose, whose work, whose scholar, so in her scholarly project with, with and curatorial project Mkuzandlu, this is where she comes to theorize this thing that is called the scattered archive, um, not which is very different from an incomplete archive. Um, and she argues that there's a lot written on Mkuzandlu. Mkuzandlu is the first um, South African woman to have a public exhibition at a gallery in South African kind of um, visual um, work. Although there is an enormous amount written on, 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 on Guzanzu, the vast majority of the work writes about her biographically, right? So, so there, there, there is a proliferation of work and some scholarship and critical reception, but the substance and the and, and the quantity belies the absolute avoidance of the actual work that she produces, right? Which is also often very similar 
to how we think about, um, so this is kind of, kind of uh, Wickham's irritation as well and, and Dangaremga's irritation, which is that I'm sick and tired of being asked, Dangaremga says often, I'm sick and tired of being asked about my relationship to Tambu, right? I'm sick and tired because the expectation is that and the, the, and, 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 and the implication is, 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 is in fact a denial or an avoidance or a sidestepping of the terms through which these women choose to enter publicness. So you write about creative women by writing about their lives and not about the work. And so even as you are writing about them constantly, um, as we see now, in, ironically with Clyde, who has been written about in terms of the work that she's done, that very often when she, well, she, she, she she's, a, she, she's a name that gets circulated um, often outside the academy in kind of an index and reference and relationships in, in, in conversations about black women's writings and, 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 and lineages, um, but often as the first. So in many of those public discussions that Tladi emerges, there isn't really a discussion about her work. It's a discussion of, so this is kind of, I suppose what Kabir Baderun coins ambiguous visibility. You're constantly talking about Ngutlandu. You're constantly talking about Tladi. You're constantly talking about Dangaremga. You're constantly talking about Wickham. But why are you, you know, why? So this kind of, there's this constant haunting of biography. Now, why does this matter? I mean, and, 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 and I'm incredibly grateful to have Barbara to have these conversations with as well. Um, I mean, she's kind of talked about it in terms of um, what I said, but I mean, this, it's, it's a constant conversation. And so one of the calls that I made to her, and again, one of those long conversations is um, as I was writing this book about, about, about Clive, and now of course it's like a literary, it's supposed to, you know, it, 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 it has a very specific format. You're supposed to, the Voices of Liberation series, and Grace, you've written in, 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 in this series, and, and Barbara's writing in this series, and Shireen Hasim, who I see is here, is, 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 has also written in the series, is that there's a requirement of biography, right? Um, there's a requirement that we reveal certain things about, about, about the, the, the feminist figure, or whatever the figure is, um, is biography. Now, in Tladi's case, of course, Tladi was very, very careful about what she revealed about her private life. And the, one of the difficulties that I, or the decision that I made, um, and I reflect on it a little bit in the book, um, is what to reveal about her private life. When she herself was a writer who really very consciously told us very little about her personal relationships. So she tells some personal stories, but it's the same four or five stories over and over and over and over again. And so um, it seems to me then that this relationship between archive and, opac and, and privacy, opacity and, and, and privacy is, 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 is a much more troublesome than we sometimes um, imagine. And it is one that I think that we have an entire, we, we have various um, um, kind of African feminist um, interpretations and engagements with, 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 with what it means to think about to think about productive, creative, intellectual um, African feminists in ways that 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 require that demand privacy and a resistance. And so when Barbara says she has given instruction for some things to be to be destroyed, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to copy that because <laughs> and it, and it, and and I'm and I and I, you know and I and I'm and I'm laughing but I'm saying that in all in all in all in all in all in all seriousness because there are specific historical dangers that 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 that, that, that accompany um, how privacy how access to 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 kind of the biographical to the personal to the private um, intersect with um, those African feminists who have also produced and entered in, 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 public, in public ways. So I think it's an incredibly important, and in fact, I think there's an archive um, of, of, of African feminist thinking about, 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 about this that we should you know, think about as an, as, an, as, an, as an archive. Thanks so much, Pumla. And I think in a way there's a whole lot. I think that, that question in itself just needs a whole panel to itself because part of what the both of you are also speaking to is a certain 
centuries long sense of entitlement to black peoples and women's every single experience, right? And it's black people, it's women, it's poor people. And so as, as you were both speaking, for me, what, one of the things that came to mind is ETV News, and I'll name it. Um, I don't know if I have 500 million, apparently that's the cost of <laughs> these things, but my deep, deep frustration with news coverage of tragic moments in South African um, public life. And yes, it's news and yes, it's of public interest, but I've noticed a pattern in the ways in which poor black people's tragedies are delivered live and fresh on screen. This woman has just learned that three of her children have just been killed and there is a microphone and there is a camera in her face. We never see that with wealthy black people. We never see that with white people. So again, that ent that sense of entitlement, and I'm, I'm saying this to tie then back to the, the, the question again around the, the tendency to think about archives as this institutional place as things that are of interest only to academics, as things that are happening in museums and, and, and libraries and all that, and therefore not in the public sphere, but actually even on an everyday basis, on an just on an everyday basis beyond the borders of the universities and, and research institutions, folks are producing archives, folks are engaging, and, and they're also engaging in very problematic um, ways. So I really love the, 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 the phrase, you, the concept of ambiguous visibility that you, 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 you're putting on the table via um, Habiba. The other thing to just say, and then I will open up for questions, is my sense, and I haven't thought this through properly, so I could be wrong about this, but my sense is there's a certain thing like archive literacy that it's not enough that there's material that's publicly available. So access is not just about whether or not you are a, university, a UCT student or whether or not you have a card to the Johannesburg Library. Like, I mean, the, the public libraries are public and assuming we handle the questions of, of infrastructural access in the sense of you know transport and all that and literacy, they, they still, uh, literacy in the sense of being able to read and write, there's still another level of literacy that I think needs to be part of the conversation of access. So it's not enough to digitize, it's not enough to make them open access, it's not enough, actually, sometimes the opposite of that happens, that you have this deluge of content out there, which we we not, we, we, we're not schooled, um, again, wrong choice, but we're not literate in how to read it, how to work with it. And maybe that's a whole other basket of questions that we need to deal with. So um, at this point, I'll hand over to Kayo, and I'm hoping our attendants uh, don't mind us straying beyond our designated time a bit, because I think this is just such an exciting conversation for us to be having. So Kayo is going to give us the questions. We've got a whole lot of questions in the Q&A. So Kayo, over to you. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you so much, the panel. It was, it's been such an amazing, amazing conversation. We did receive a great number of very, very exciting and engaging questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have the time to go through all of them. So what I did is that I tried to collate questions that are a little bit similar. So for example, a couple of people raised interesting questions in terms of generational tensions, which is something that has been raised by the panel. In particular, the question on whether or not there is a divide in terms how younger and older feminists think about access to the colonial archive or think about the colonial archive in general. In other words, what transgenerational mean in the context of South African feminism? Secondly, there are a couple of interesting questions also about what the archive actually is. How do we think about the archive? How do we theorize it? Is it as fixed as one may think, or is actually something that is quite con contingent and um, transformative in a way? So feminists are always producing archives. We are always producing archives in our research projects, but we still have to grapple with the question, how, to in, how do we engage different sets of materials? 
And in that particular issue, there is a specific, a specific question about how do we integrate fictional writings into our own readings and understandings of the archive? Is fiction a form of biographical archive? Is it, is it a way in which we can access undocumented histories? And the third question, and then if we have time, we'll go to another set of another set of questions. But the third question that I picked on has to do with digitization and access to these archives. Um, obviously, that is related to issues of democratization, of accessibility, and also to the question of or whether or not digitization is an alternative to archival destruction, as you know, in cases such as the library in UCT. But then I guess digitization also raises a bunch of questions in ethical questions, questions about privacy as well, which is related to a broader, under, a broader concern on whether private lives are private and in what terms. So I guess let's deal with these three sets of questions. And then obviously you can choose which ones you want to address because they are all very complex. So don't feel obliged to address all of these issues, but um, yeah, feel free to address what you want. And then we'll go to a second round. Thank you. Um, I'll talk about the issue of intergenerationality since I was the one who raised that initially. And I'm very much still thinking through this issue. Um, one of the phrases that comes to mind um, when I think through this and in my conversations also is Audre Lorde's um, writing and saying the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. And I think for me, I'm speaking from a very personal place. I'm not claiming to represent my generation or anything like that. Um, what, it, what it meant for me um, to access the university as uh, someone who, who came of age in 1990, the, um, because that was such a, um, uh, uh, the institution was so um, inaccessible to me in my imagination as a child um, that when I accessed it as a young person, um, I perhaps was very keen to, ma to master it, to use a, a, a phallocentric, not phallocentric, but a male-centric term. I want, and, and I'm using that deliberately. I wanted to master the conventions of the university. I wanted to um, belong. I wanted to um, succeed there on the terms of the university, right? Um, and when I look at the generation um, that is writing now, um, a, a perhaps a generation um, that, that, that is after me chronologically, um, as I mentioned, a lot of these feminists were forged through the, the, the fallist movements. And there's a completely different relationship to the institution, um, which is that things need to fall, right? Things that, that don't serve us. And, and we can interrogate what that means, but there is a way in which um, becoming, uh, being absorbed, becoming part of the institutional that is, institution that is untransformed is not um, palatable and not acceptable to these younger feminists. Um, they want to transform the institution on their own terms. And I think um, in thinking through issues of transgenerationality is that they are forging a different relationship to the archive, bringing it back to the question of the archive, to, to archives. When, when I think about, there's a question that I saw from Shireen, what, what is the archive? Um, I think of multiple archives and multiple locations, and I want to be able to travel from the one to the other and work with one to the other. 
Um, and, and for example, again, my training as a graduate student in the United States, I did a semester long course on archival research with a historian and a historian of African American history who taught us how to physically go into the archive, uh, into whatever archive you, you choose, um, or an online archive and, and find things. So I wanted to really understand it. I wanted to know the conventions. And I wanted to work within those conventions, perhaps, even though I'm working against the grain, if you will. Um, my sense is, and I don't want to, again, speak for others, is that there's a new relationship emerging um, with people wanting to completely transform it. They, they perhaps do not. Um, I, yeah, let me stop this because I don't want to speak for other people. Thank you. Sorry, I kept. Um, okay, thank you. That is a wonderful cluster of, um, of, of questions. I think for me, um, I'm going to, and of course, it's wonderful that I mean, I, I, I agree with so much of what Barbara said. So I won't repeat, I won't repeat that. I think that, you know, we, when we're talking about the archive, we, are also always, and I mean, I think it's important and I think it's wonderful that we add a time in the history of, or in the stories of the academy where we're spending so much time talking about archives um, outside of history departments um, in, in which I was partly trained. I'm a literary scholar, but I'm partly trained in, 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 in history. And I think it's important. And I think this question of what, what an archive is, what an archive does is an important one to retain as a question, um, because I, I think um, we, we, at any given point when we're talking about an archive, we are talking about a whole range of different things at the same time. And I don't think that this talking about a whole range of different things at the same time is, I'm, I'm, I, yes, it can be a problem, but I'm talking about it. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm highlighting the way in which, um, that consciousness and that deliberate speaking about it as different things at the same time is in fact productive and generative and useful and, and, and important for the kind of conversations that we're having. And so, um, and of course, when we're talking about the archive, there are some relatively shared ideas. So I, I, for me, when I'm talking about the archive, I'm partly thinking about the archives that I was trained in when I was being trained in historiography. So I'm thinking about the dusty, thing that you have to go when you are doing your projects for the history department um, at UCT and at Warwick, where you are looking at specific things about the 19th century and slavery or women's employment patterns in the case. So I'm thinking about that archive, yes. I'm also thinking about um, archives um, as, 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 as different kinds of collections, right? So when we're thinking, I'm thinking about the, 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 the relationship of sometimes a physical thing, but not necessarily a physical thing, that is a collection of things of um, that that have a that in the collection there is established a relationship between 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 these things. So collections of things organized with specific logics, um, and the logics themselves are part of the archive and, and not just part of the archive archi archiving. So that's that that's part of the thinking that I bring to to my to my use of the word archive, right? So I'm using the, I, I, I have very in mind, sometimes I, do, and as a, and a, as a, not just as someone who's historiographically trained, but also as someone who's trained in, in, in literary studies specifically, um, there is a sense of a physical archive that I'm talking about, but there is also a sense of, a, of, of, of a physical archive, of a not physical archive, of an, of, of, of an archive of ideas, a, a cluster, a collection of ways of thinking about, um, Things. I'm, 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 I'm thinking in terms of my own career, some part of my graduate um, training in the, in, 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 briefly in the, in, 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 in the British Academy and thinking about courses between literary scholars um, and, and, and historians that had titles like fictions and histories, right? So the idea of, 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 of how um, the organizing of certain kinds of ideas and ways of telling and, 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 and forms of knowledges are both 
um, fictions and histories in 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 in, in, in different in different in different intersect in different intersecting ways. And so, no, I don't think we can ever have a complete archive. I think I think and and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a, not a good thing. I think that's a that's a that's a that's a creatively productive thing. Um, of course, to say so, um, I think in 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 situations such as this discussion and this combination of 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 of, of thinkers and, and 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 scholars seems uncontroversial. But I think it's important to remember that it remains controversial to think about to think about. Um, to think in some parts of the of the of the of the of the academy, right? So that we can take in many ways for granted that, that the archives are perpetually incomplete after several kind of um, ways of thinking about about completion and narrative and 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 and, and so on, um, depending on which critical theoretical um, tradition we belong in. But that in fact there are still bodies of scholarship that insist on. Complete archives as a as a as a thing that exists that that, that that exists in the world, and so I suppose for me, um, it's important for my own work um, and praxis. It's important to bear in mind the 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 the, the coexistence, sometimes in tension, sometimes in friction, sometimes in frottage, um, of those of those um, of those different kinds of, of 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 ways of approaching and recognizing and thinking about what a what and and and, and curation of, of, what an, of what an archive what an archive is I find most useful um, the, 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 the the cluster of way of, of, of epistemic traditions that 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 that, that see the, the archive as, 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 as perpetually incomplete um, much more so than than, 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 than the other um, for reasons we don't have time to go into um, and I think in terms of fiction and archive, I mean, that, that, that question about the relationship between fiction and archive is a deceptively simple one. Um, for, especially for, interestingly, this panel of literary scholars, I think it's a deceptively simple one. I mean, I think as, as, as scholars of literature, we, 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 you know, when we think about uh, uh, um, the relationship between fiction and archive, it, the relationship between fiction and archive is, 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 is the business in one sense that is the very business of what literary scholarship um, is, right? What fiction is, how fiction works and, 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 and how it means and how it relates to and whether, um, of course it's an archive. I think within that discipline, what that means to say, yes, it's an archive might differ significantly, but I think you're going to be hard pressed to find a literary scholar who doesn't think that the relationship between fiction um, and archive, whatever that, that 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 might mean, but I want to go back to that formulation of fictions and 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 um, and, and, and archives um, as well, and to evoke um, Acharya's um, thinking about kind of fiction and 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 and, 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 and friction as well. And so I don't actually think that we can answer in a straightforward way. The, 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 what the relationships are between fiction and 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 and, and, and archive because they they I think they shift but they also depend they they, they they change depending on who on who on 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 what we are asking that question for and where we are asking that question from so the relationship between archive and fiction can be very taken for granted and assumed and in in, in, in a range of positions from conservative to decolonial, right? Or mark socialist, whatever, from, from the far right to the far left in certain disciplines and in certain kind of projects. Um, but they can also be the, the kind of very useful, um, um, uh, very usefully um, unstable um, um, connections. So I think it's, it, yeah, the answer, I suppose the, 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 the Answer I'm going to give in the part answer I'm going to give is is that it depends what you're doing with that relationship. It depends what that question is 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 being is being is being is being asked for. But there isn't there, there cannot I think um, be one kind of, of 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 response to that. I'm not going to say anything about generational tensions. I think Barbara was fantastic on that. I want to say one sentence. 
on digitization and archives and say something rather old fashioned and um, unpo well, uh, old, 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 old fashioned. I mean, I think that part of what the, 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 the fire UCT and several other um, ongoing conversations around digitization and archives keep bringing up for me are the, is the importance of, of, of troubling that relationship as well. I think very often digital archives and digitization taken as, a, as an advance, as a, as, 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 as a supplementary, as a, as a replication, right? That if we, just, if we just find the right way to digitize, um, to digitize non-digital archives, then, then this moves us closer to a, to a, to a solution. Um, but I, I, I have been very, very struck by how quickly sometimes digital archives can also disappear. Um, and so perhaps then the, 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 you know, I mean, quite literally kind of enormous amounts of feminist work um, and, 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 and alternative work that was there and that we knew was there like 10 years ago that has simply vanished and there's no way to recuperate it because it didn't have. Um, and so I think that the relationship between um, archives, old fashioned kinds of archives and, and, and digitization actually is, a, is, a, is one that we, that we need to trouble um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as as a as, as colleague and friend and often says, all we need really is one digital storm and the security of the digital archive um, is brought into not a digital storm. It's called something else. I'm I'm calling it the wrong thing. But you know, so 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 um, digital archives are as precarious, um, in fact, as physical archives um, are, 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 are have been shown have been shown to be from kind of physical um, um, threats. Okay, I'm gonna stop. And Pumla, I suppose also. So there's so many embedded assumptions that go with the word archive that one one is constantly have to strip away before we actually now get down to the work. And something as simple as the, the working assumption that um, that archives, especially print archives, but also just record records broadly are stable, right? That they travel across time in a stable manner, but actually, when we think about it a bit more, they aren't. They 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 accumulate all sorts of traces along the way, depending on what happens across time and you know social, cultural, and political dynamics. That the same material, if we were to access material, certain material in twenty in nineteen twenty one, that same material accessing it now, we as well as that material both sets of, of us have accumulated all sorts of debris and stuff, right? That by the time we are coming to it, there's just, it's a different, it's, we will arrive at, a, we will meet a different archive and we will arrive at different interpretations. Because we, we, so archives themselves also change no matter how stable um, they might seem. And for us as literary scholars, just basics, folks who reading Things Fall Apart in 1960, reading things fall apart in 2021, what is it doing? What's the relationship? So there's a whole, I think there's a whole lot that, that, that's also happening there that, um, yeah, but anyway, um, I'm getting the, the sense from Kayo that we have time for one more round of questions. So Kayo, is that correct? No, actually, I think we are really approaching okay. our, uh, <laughs> our, very, our very limit. But, you know, I think the debate has been so, so great, even if we couldn't go through all the questions, it has been extremely fruitful. Okay, thank you so much, Kayu. And I'm, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to the rest of the questions. And I would strongly encourage colleagues to just have a look at the questions at the very least. They're just so rich and exciting and i'm a firm believer in reading all the questions even at conferences when time has run out i insist on you know folks should hear the questions even if we won't answer them but in this case you've had them on the chat so please have a read if you haven't and um i'll then hand back to uh, before i hand back to kaya and, and Srila, i just want to say a big thank you to barbara and 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 pomla and i'm so sorry we didn't get uh Kossi, but I'm hoping that's a sign that we need to have another similar arrangement sometime in future, um, inshallah. 
and then we can continue these exciting conversations. But thank you very much to the team behind Governing Intimacies. And now I'll hand back to you. Maybe you have closing remarks on what next? What can we look out for? ATC, so thanks. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you so much, Pumla, Barbara. This, this has, we couldn't have wished for a more exciting panel to end the semester with. And I just wanted to say to everyone who's still here, our attendees, thank you so much for joining the webinars throughout the semester. And please stay tuned to the Governing Intimacies website and our Facebook page because we'll be soon publicizing the schedule for the second semester. So I think that that's it. Thank you again, the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right.